Hello, my name is The Cozy Representative, and today we're going to be ranking all the Fall Out Boy studio albums from worst to best. Here we go. This is a love song uh, told from the perspective of the hips. first single off of our new record and it's for all the girls out there because this is what boys do when they're home alone in the dark thinking about you it's called sugar we're going down i mean to me it's like i think we just kind of originally stood out because of patrick's voice was one of the biggest things it's like nobody in the scene we came from really sang like that he sang soulfully and had this just really rich voice and i think that was the probably the biggest thing that stood us out i think there's a lot of subtle things like like, in a lot of ways, we still see ourselves as a hardcore band, right? So we're going to go up and thrash and break instruments and stuff, and that's just kind of, like, par for the course. That's not, like... So there's, it's one of those things where there's nothing really contrived about us, and because of that, there are a lot of weird little things about us that I guess make us different. I don't know, but none, none of it's ever really, like... I couldn't identify all of them because I didn't really think about them. It's pretty organic. We yeah. never went out and was like, we're like... We better act like this or whatever. Yeah. You know, you, and in fact, we get told to act differently all the time. You know, like they're, yeah. So, um, is there is there anything that you're saying five, ten years from now we we want to try, we want to do that you haven't done? But I mean, you've talked about how organic everything is. You just you have the opportunity to pretty much do what you want at this point. Is there anything that you're that you're kind of looking? further down that you're like, okay. I mean, at the end of the day, like, Fall Out Boy to me is, like, equivalent of, like, cave paintings. It's just proof that we existed, and so I think we just want to keep doing Fall Out Boy as it is, and, you know, it'll keep evolving, and there's not a point right now where, you know, we're not bored with what we're doing, so, um, I don't know. We're, we're, we're excited to be Fall Out Boy, you know? Fall Out Boy are an American rock band uh, formed in the suburbs of Chicago in 2001. After gaining success in the alternative emo underground with 2003's Take This to Your Grave, the band exploded into real, palpable, mainstream success with 2005's From Under the Cork Tree, propelled by radio hit singles like Sugar We're Going Down and Dance Dance. Don't The band, along with other contemporary acts like My Chemical Romance, Taking Back Sunday, and Paramore, are credited in being the forefathers of the mainstream emo slash pop punk explosion in the mid to late 2000s. Pete Wentz was even looked at as a real proper A-list celebrity during this time, a frequent tabloid fixture who was doing things like hanging out with Jay-Z, signing hot up-and-coming rapper Tyga to his label Decadence Records, and marrying and having a baby with Ashley Simpson. Pete Wentz had the game shook. During this time, From Under the Cork Tree went double platinum. 2007's Infinity on High also went double platinum, but once 2008's Folia Adieu rolled around, Fall Out Boy's most out-of-the-box and experimental record yet, often referred to by fans as Patrick Stump's pet sounds, so to speak, more on that later, it didn't sell as well as the previous two albums, you know, it only went gold. <laughs> and there was also this narrative that the fans weren't into Folia Do as much, which is highly debated. I can tell you personally as a Fall Out Boy fan of like 15 years, me and all the other Fall Out Boy fans loved Folia Do when it came out. I don't remember any hate, but it is what it is. Uh, I think at the end of the day, what really happened is Patrick really bared his soul in in a like Pinkerton Weezer esque way on Folia Do, and the fact that it wasn't this huge smash success like the two records before it gave him the impression that people hated it. The Rivers Cuomo effect, if you will. Also, Fall Out Boy had just gotten too big. The mainstream cultural zeitgeist became oversaturated with Fall Out Boy and the hundreds of bands who were getting big trying to sound like Fall Out Boy, and the boys were just tired. So, Fall Out Boy took a break. A hiatus if you will, from 2009 until they returned a few years later with 2013's Save Rock and Roll, which supported by pop radio single Light Em Up achieved platinum status. This record was then followed by 2015's American Beauty, American Psycho, which also received platinum status with the success of more pop radio singles like Uma Thurman and the huge, gigantic number one hit 
centuries. But much like Foley Adu's impact 10 years prior, 2018's more experimental mania failed to sell nearly as well as the previous two albums, literal Groundhog's Day there as far as Fall Out Boy's career. Um, I don't think mania has even gone gold, and despite the fact that it was number one on the charts when it came out, and it was a literally Grammy-nominated rock album uh, where it actually lost a Grammy to Greta Van Fleet, which is really funny, uh, it got, uh, as a whole, it got a mixed reaction from the fan base. Now, there has always been this sort of new Fall Out Boy fan versus old Fall Out Boy fan thing amongst the Fall Out Boy fandom universe, you know what I'm saying? Once Fall Out Boy had returned from their hiatus in 2013, their music was a lot different. It was way more stripped down, way poppier, less in-your-face, hard-on-your-sleeve intensity, less guitars, less real drums, way more contemporary. Uh, a lot of the older generation Fall Out Boy fans who grew up with them before for the hiatus who know Fall Out Boy as this sort of anti-jock for the outcasts I'm suffering from depression in middle school emo pop type thing don't really identify as much with the new, more mainstream radio, oftentimes veering into jock jam, sports arena, Reebok commercial, axe body spray soundtrack territory like they do with their post-hiatus material. <laughs> A lot of the old fans do not like new Fall Out Boy, and while I personally am from the older generation of Fall Out Boy fans, I found them uh, on From Under the Cork Tree when that record blew up all the way back in 2005, I was literally like nine years old. <laughs> so you know, I would consider myself an old school Fall Out Boy fan, and I should say this now, uh, Fall Out Boy are actually no joke my favorite band of all time. Uh, however, while I do have my criticisms of their post hiatus material, and I did kind of hate it at first. I really have given it the time of day over the years, and I don't hate it like other older fans of the band tend to. While I do prefer the older stuff, I think the newer stuff has a lot of merit, uh, a lot more forward-thinking experimentation, and really, at the end of the day, is a lot deeper and cooler than most people seem to want to give it credit for. It's just, you know, the big, chart-topping, mainstream sports arena singles like Centuries that kind of give it a bad rap. Anyways, like I said, today I'm going to be ranking all the Fall Out Boy's albums from what I think is the worst to what I think is the best, and while I think you'll agree with me and hear where I'm coming from on some of these choices, I think some of my other choices or uh, where certain albums are placed on my ranking might get some hate. I don't know. We'll see. I'll try to explain myself as best as I can, uh, but I think we can all agree on what the worst one is, though. Yes, 2003's Evening Out With Your Girlfriend. Now, before I get into it, I do have to say that it's often been debated whether or not this is actually considered a real, actual Fall Out Boy album. It was recorded in like two days in 2002 with a different lineup. Drummer Andy Hurley was not in the band yet. Uh, and they were actually a five piece. Patrick just sang, Pete was on bass, Joe was on guitar, and someone else was on second guitar, and someone else was on drums. Random people from the local scene, as far as I know. No. You know, when we started, we were the worst band ever, playing the worst music you have ever heard. Um, it got better as time went on. I do not consider this to be Fall Out Boy's real first official album, primarily due to the fact, and this is a fact, uh, that Fall Out Boy didn't actually want to release this album at all at the time. They recorded it super quickly, they thought it was sloppy and not good enough, but the label that they were on, Uprising Records, which is owned by the dude from fucking Vegan Reich, which is funny, Uprising Records released this album without Fall Out Boy's consent, totally unauthorized, just two months before they released uh, what I consider 
consider to be their real first full length, Take This to Your Grave on Fueled by Ramen Records, which caused confusion amongst fans at the time. They also released it unauthorized without the band's consent again, a remastered version in 2005, once Fall Out Boy started blowing up in the mainstream and, you know, the Fall Out Boy name was a cash cow. <laughs> so the fact that this album basically only exists because this label wanted to, I guess, make a chunk of change off of our fearless emo leaders Fall Out Boy without permission makes me go, yeah, this isn't really their first real album. Um, but it is an interesting release. It exists. It's out there. And I wanted to talk about it. And yes, I think it's pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, this album is definitely a charming listen. I will give it that. Where it may lack in standout songwriting and good performances of the songs, it definitely makes up for in charm and, you know, it's refreshing musical youthful innocence. Hello, friends. Real quick, I want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Ride or Die Clothing. Ride or Die Clothing is a super awesome, up-and-coming rock and roll clothing line out of California run by my good friend, Frankie Circa. Check out these threads. The shirts are great quality, a fair price, and will have you looking like you're hopping straight out of the tour bus at Warp Tour 2007. Cracking open a bottle of Jack Daniels with Gabe Saporta and Martin Johnson by your side. I personally wear many different ride or die shirts on an extremely regular basis and I can say with confidence that it is a fine, quality product, which is actually scientifically proven to make you at least 53% more dope, fresh, and awesome. To check out Ride or Die, you can follow them on Instagram at instagram.com slash ride or die brand. Or to purchase some of these dope threads, head to their website, Ride or Die Clothing. Dot net. Once again, that's RiderDieClothing.net. Thank you for your time. Big shout out to Rider Die Clothing for sponsoring. And with that, back to the video. It's also very interesting to go back and hear the embryonic stages of what we now know as Fall Out Boy. Uh, this album's version of Calm Before the Storm is a bit rough around the edges, uh, but a much tighter and more energetic version did go on to appear on 2003's Take This to Your Grave. I've always had a soft spot for the opening track on this record, Honorable Mention, as well as the fourth track, Pretty and Punk. These songs aren't anything super amazing, but I appreciate, like I was saying, the tender, innocent, emo, sincerity in the lovesick and self-deprecating lyrics. These are two tracks that I tend to go back to more than others on this album. Some other notable tracks are Growing Up, Moving Pictures, and Switchblades and Infidelity, all three of which also appeared on Fall Out Boy's 2002 split EP with fellow local Chicago band Project Rocket, which actually was an authorized release from the band, which leads me to believe that these were the strongest songs of this batch of songs in the band's eyes, you know, and I would probably agree with them on that. The the World's Not Waiting for Five Tired Boys in a Broken Down Van is a song I've always appreciated. To me, this one sounds kind of like a more of a precursor to the sound and style that they would perfect and hone in on on Take This to Your Grave. Now, my favorite song on this album, and definitely what I would consider to be the most underrated, uh, is the closing track on this album, which is called Parker Lewis Can't Lose. It's a melancholy, slower emo song, and parts of this song are really genuinely beautiful. Like, they really hit a real sweet spot on this song. I thought they did a great job on this one. However, despite this album's charm, and glimpses of an early version of the emo pop greatness that Fall Out Boy was later to achieve, at the end of the day there is a huge list of reasons why it's not considered much of a classic and 
rightfully isn't even considered a real album by the band and the fans. Uh, for one thing, it's super sloppy. You can tell the drummer did not play to a metronome, and you can also tell that he really needed one, because the songs are just, they just, they're all over the place. They speed up and slow down. The drummer is not in the pocket at all. There is some cool, like, saves the day-esque pop punk guitar stuff going on, but it's the same thing. The guitars are played sloppy, and they're all out of time, too. The rhythm and lead parts will be speeding up and slowing down separately, all out of sync with each other. It's just kind of rough to listen to. The whole record kind of just sounds like someone's first high school local pop punk band who just like wrote some songs but totally aren't show ready yet. <laughs> and considering Patrick was like 16 years old on this, that's literally kind of what it actually was. That's another thing. Patrick's voice like wasn't good yet. <laughs> he wasn't like bad, uh, but he was kind of nasal. His voice was more grating on this album, a total far cry from the incredible vocalist he later became. He kind of sounds like a knockoff, less good Chris Conley from Saves the Day on this album. Uh, that's basically what this whole album feels like and kind of is at the end of the day. A sloppy recreation of Through Being Cool by Saves the Day, but with sloppy performances and songs that are really nothing to write home about at the end of the day. I'm sorry, evening out with your girlfriend. You're a cool little fun collector's item, uh, but I don't think anybody would be talking about this album or even remembering this album at all if it wasn't technically one of the first releases by... Fall Out Boy. Can you smell that? It smells like fear. Fear of change. For too long this school has operated under the hood of hate and oppression. No longer can you use your Gestapo tactics to hold us down. Finally, the oppressed are coming together to remove the hood. This Friday after school we will be rallying for peace and equality. You're all invited to join us. Believe me, now that the change has been put into motion, there's no stopping us now. Which leads me to my least favorite official Fall Out Boy release, where we will be transitioning into a completely different period in Fall Out Boy's career. Uh, not sure if everyone will agree with me on this one, uh, but here goes. She's an American beauty. With Save Rock and Roll, it almost is like a mulligan when it comes to the recording process because we did it in secret, so we kind of like just recorded however we wanted, you know, like, and did it the way we wanted to. This was our first record where, or album, where we really had to approach it and understand that the way, if you want to make music that is relevant to pop culture and that uh, you, you record in a different way now than we did, you know, eight years ago yeah. when we recorded a record. It's just a different process, and I think this was the first real experience. It was like we were thrown in the deep end with it, like where it's yeah. like, we could all record at our houses, and it was yeah. just like a different, it was a it was a different process, yeah. which is cool, and I think it made the album sound a little different. And it, it was interesting, too, because I think this album is probably the most um, improvisational in a lot of ways, because we were, because our time was at such a premium with each other, you know, at any given point, all four of us, getting all four of us in a room was really hard because, you know, it's like, ah, uh, yeah, you know, it's all family stuff, right? Um, so in that way, you kind of like came in, threw out all your great ideas and then left for the day and everybody else kind of picked at them. And, uh, and it was great because the whole thing came together really, really quickly and it's very first thought, best thought. And so... Rather than, you know, I, I'm one of those guys I like to sit and, and work on or work on something forever and, and work it to death. And this, I get to kind of take a step back and, and appreciate it because I don't have, you know, I, there was a lot of, there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears and all that, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite as much, you know, like reworking and reworking and reworking, you know? All right. Yes. Next up is 2015's American Beauty, American Psycho, Fall Out Boy's second release post hiatus. Now this album was a huge success for the band. Like I said earlier, the album went platinum. Uh, the single Centuries itself also went platinum and that song is gigantic. Uh, this album really, really defines the second coming of Fall Out Boy in the mainstream. I mean, Centuries is basically Basically, Fall Out Boy's equivalent to Panic at the Disco's High Hopes, you know what I mean? In the sense where a band who blew up 10 years prior and got mainstream level big in a whole 
previous era of culture becomes a multi-generational act by becoming just as big amongst the newer, younger listeners that make up the next generation of music fans. And very much like Panic at the Disco's High Hopes, most older Fall Out Boy fans can't fucking stand centuries. <laughs> Instead of pandering to old heads like me on this album and trying to recreate the underdog emo pop punk glory of From Under the Cork Tree, Fall Out Boy made something for the new generation and they succeeded. I'm sure this album bought Pete Wentz a few pools or nice cars or something. <laughs> uh, and that's really the, the whole reason why this album is so low on my list. I don't even necessarily like hate this album or think that it's all that bad. Um, the majority of songs on here I've actually grown to like by this point, but as a longtime huge fan of the band, this album really was the first one where Fall Out Boy really kind of let me down, you know? Uh, the first time I heard this record, I was like, wow, this isn't like bad music technically, but this is officially no longer, like this does not sound anything even related to the the emo pop punk band that I grew up loving. That was my first initial take, my first impression of this album, and that's still kind of what this album represents to me. It's the first album where Fall Out Boy really felt like this big, gaudy, overblown, like mainstream arena contemporary thing that, like I said, sounds more like an album of assorted Axe body spray commercials, Reebok commercials, and Super Bowl halftime show bumper music. <laughs> Jock jams aka the music that is made for and consumed by the exact jocks, the chads and the stacys, the normies who grew up bullying the emo kids who found solace and refuge in Fall Out Boy's older pop punkier music. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> this album, it doesn't feel like the band Fall Out Boy anymore. The four guys playing in a room rock band feeling, you know, it's total contemporary pop radio production. There's barely any guitar barely any drums. Like, Andy Hurley is one of my favorite drummers of all time. I want to hear him rip it up. He's like nowhere to be found on this album. You could tell me that this album is a Patrick Stump solo album, and I would believe you. I mean, there's got to be a thrill in that, right? When you know that you've sort of broken this unspeakable uh, boundary or this barrier that people have erected kind of really, you know, arbitrarily, right? Like, you know, the divisions between music, you know, why do you think that people are still so hell-bent on trying to pigeonhole you guys as a band, like, you know, who Fall Out Boy is. I think, people, I think people like genre a lot, and it makes them feel comfortable being able to organize things and being able to, like, say, well, this goes here, and so this is, like, this kind of music or this kind of thing. I think it's just, it's kind of human nature to a degree. Yeah, I mean, does, does it sort of piss you off? Has there been a moment where you're kind of like, no, this person just... They've got us wrong. Like you just you don't get it, or you know, at the right at the beginning when people are talking to you and saying, "Oh, you're a representative of emo," and now they're like, "Oh, well, you're the stadium rock band." Like you know, does yeah. that kind of annoy you? It doesn't really annoy me. It's just kind of funny when it's projected onto you as a thing that you should care about. You know, because it's because we don't. We've always just been doing our thing. You know, we were never we we are equally as not concerned about being a jock rock band as we were equally not as concerned about being an emo band. We were just doing our thing, and. Um, and uh, so I think you kind of can't get too caught up in it because, I don't know, that's the thing is we've gotten to do so many things and see so many different kinds of artists and, and cross-culturally we talk to, you know, DJs, you know, electronic musicians and country artists and, and metal, everything, every, players from everywhere, jazz players. Everyone listens to lots of music. No one's listening to just the thing that's their, their lane or whatever. And I think that's really, you know, that's... We want to be referred to as a gang. As a gang, like with with like symbols, hand signals, and everything. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was kind of heartbroken when this album first came out, and like I said, this was six years ago now. Um, I've had a lot of time to reflect and listen to this album since, but that initial feeling that this album gave me has never really left my mind. However, I have grown to really enjoy certain songs on this album, uh, specifically a lot of the deep cuts that I want to talk about. Novocaine and 4th of July are definitely my two favorite songs on this album. They're both super energetic, great strong choruses, amazing stuff from Patrick and the whole band. Uh, these songs have a real sense of urgency and are close enough to hitting the sweet spots about what I love about older Fall Out Boy while still pushing it into a new updated direction in like the right way. I wish the whole record sounded more like these two songs. Jetpack Blues and The Kids Aren't Alright are, albeit a bit cheesy, 
Two solid mid-tempo tear jerkers, which really do pull at the old heartstrings when listened to in like the right moment. I've also always thought that the opening track, uh, Irresistible, was a really great song and really starts off the album on a great foot. Fall Out Boy are always really good at like album openers, you know what I mean? The closing track on this record is also a really big standout, uh, Twin Skeletons, Hotel, and NYC. This song kind of has a little bit of an Infinity on High vibe on it a little bit. Now, I do appreciate the outside the box experimental you know futuristic pop rock approach on songs like Uma Thurman or the title track American Beauty American Psycho those songs are definitely more musically risky and experimental and like left field out on a limb than any of like Panic at the Disco's recent stuff you know what I mean uh, however despite how big of a song Uma Thurman is it's just never really been my cup of tea uh, it's experimentation feels more like aimless experimentation that doesn't really hit on any emotional or visceral soft spots for me, you know? Uh, same thing with the title track, American Beauty, American Psycho. I can kind of see what they were trying to go for on this song, uh, but I've always thought this song is just honestly super annoying. I've never liked it. It just doesn't make sense to me. It's never grown on me. I just think this is an annoying-ass song, man. American Beauty, American Psycho. Uh, I don't like it. And Centuries uh, sounds like Animals by Maroon 5. Next! There's like gonna be two eras of Fall Out Boy, you know, like it, there was a decisive split, you know, like there was a decisive, this is Fall Out Boy version 2.0, like everything about it is different, even how we play the new songs is with a different spirit, I think, so, the or the old songs, I'm sorry, the old songs, with a different spirit, so, um, to me it definitely is a rock and roll, like it is the best Fall Out Boy album, I think. Yes, indeed, y'all. 2013's Save Rock and Roll, Fall Out Boy's official return from their three or so year hiatus. Welcome. Another platinum record for Fall Out Boy, uh, and also the album's lead single, My Songs Know What You Did in the Dark parentheses light them up was a huge pop radio hit as well which i think was pretty unexpected for the band considering they didn't know what to expect returning from their hiatus. Now, while this album may have been the follow-up to 2008's Folie Adieu, you can only really consider it a follow-up to that album by technicality, because Fall Out Boy were not even remotely reaching into the nostalgia bag for this record musically. Um, there was nothing about this record that felt like it was the next logical step they would have taken directly following a record like Folie Adieu. Fall Out Boy were back with an all-new, stripped-down, like, vaguely experimental pop sound and fallout boy 2.0 had officially commenced on save rock and roll not to mention fallout boy weren't an emo band anymore on this record for the first time there is barely anything remotely emo or pop punk at least in the classic senses of those genres uh, about save rock and roll it's a pop album, a pop rock album, I guess. Now, let me put it this way. I feel like Save Rock and Roll is the album that Fall Out Boy would have made in 2013 anyway, had there, like, not been a hiatus at all, and they were still, like, releasing records and evolving since 2008 throughout that time. Like, for what it's worth, the record did sound renewed, rejuvenated, and contemporary enough in, like, a genuine... A, a real genuine way to where Fall Out Boy didn't feel washed up on this record. Uh, whereas a good majority of their contemporary bands from the Fueled by Ramen glory days were starting to feel a little washed up. I mean, emo and like Scene Kid Warp Tour stuff, the whole world which Fall Out Boy came from and embodied and took to the next level was officially like for real out of style at this time and for the most part was pretty uncool uh, around 2013, 2014. It hadn't yet reached its resurgence, like its renaissance, like like it has in the past few years. Emo stuff was looked at as outdated once 2013 rolled around, especially in the mainstream. Well, as far as like rock music is concerned, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I do want to say though, I think Fall Out Boy did a bang up job at updating the band in a tasteful and genuinely believable way. I remember recognizing that about this album at the time and appreciating it. Um, although it was a new updated, like more honed 
tuned in and less frantic pop sound, uh, this record always still very much felt like Fall Out Boy to me, and it still does. And I'm gonna be honest with you, uh, despite how low this album is on my ranking, that's only because there's so many great fucking Fall Out Boy albums, and Save Rock and Roll, I really like this record. I think it pumps, man. Where Did the Party Go and Miss Missing You, and probably The Phoenix, I would also say, are uh, my favorite songs on this album. Those songs all feel very urgent and in the pocket and really hit the nail on the head for what I felt like Fall Out Boy in 2013 like should sound like, you know, or should have sounded like or whatever. I'm a really big fan of the choruses on songs like The Mighty Fall and Death Valley. Very intense songs, those two. I mean, despite this album being more stripped down and definitely more poppy, these songs specifically are really kind of dark, like intense pop, and Patrick did an amazing job at some of these uh, choruses, which are as intense as they are soaring. What a talented guy. Alone Together, solid song. Straightforward pop rock, well done. Can't knock it, I ain't mad at it. Some cringy lyrics a little bit in this one, but whatever. Just One Yesterday shows the boys veering into some, I don't know, like Adele territory, which in itself isn't a bad thing. Um, and I do think they tackled this sound in a unique way that only Fall Out Boy could. I like this song. Ratatat, another juiced song, has a fucking Courtney Love feature on it, which is insane. And the closing track, the song Save Rock and Roll, is an extremely well executed mid tempo classic rock power ballad featuring, get this, fucking Elton John. <laughs> wow. And guess what? Uh, this song has a few cool, like, callbacks to older Fall Out Boy songs. It samples a line from Take This to Your Graves, Chicago was so two years ago. And Elton John sings the lyric, I will defend the faith going down swinging alongside Patrick both of them in sync with each other almost brings a goddamn tear to my eye every single time I can even get down to the light em up 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 song I appreciate how it's got one of the most wacky experimental out of the box vocal melodies and vocal arrangements specifically on the verses um, yet it still became this huge radio hit I think it's funny uh, because it's in the verses it's a really nerdy ass melody that like only Patrick Stump could have come up with. And when you think about it, it's pretty like hard to sing along to, hard for like a, ma a big mass audience to like sing to. Um, it's all rhythmically weird, but it didn't matter. It still became this huge unexpected radio single. Um, I guess the straightforwardness of the chorus is uh, made up for the weirdness in the verse. I don't know. song I can really confidently say that I dislike on this album is Young Volcanoes. Uh, to me, this song feels like Fall Out Boy trying to do their own version of Hey Soul Sister by Train, which is probably my actual least favorite song of all time. I, I, I really just can't stand Young Volcanoes. I've, I've never liked this song. I still don't. Um, I actually distinctly remember this being the first time in my life I had ever like disliked a Fall Out Boy song, like for real. They were my favorite band and I had never not liked any of their songs before. pre -hiatus. I literally liked all of those songs to a certain degree. Young Volcanoes was the first one where I was like, nope, not it. Sorry, Fall Out Boy. And I'm still like, nope, not it. Whenever I hear Young Volcanoes, it sounds like Hey Soul Sister by Train to me. Like, and it's weird because I don't really, I talk to other people about the song and other people seem to like it, but I just can't, I just can't do it, man. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Those are just my thoughts. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, there's not a whole lot that I don't like about Save Rock and Roll, and the only real reason why it's so low on this list, aside from there being so many other great Fall Out Boy records, the one thing that puts most of the other records above this one for me is simply because, all in all, uh, this record has always felt kind of tame to me. It felt like they were playing it safe, in a sense. Uh, while there are dark and experimental moments, uh, and intense musical moments scattered here and there throughout this album, the band feels a bit timid, like they have some cool ideas, uh, and you know, they're definitely talented guys musically, but overall it feels like they were either too afraid, or just plain unwilling to go out and really fire off on all cylinders musically. I mean, we all know that the band is more than capable of making a great record which really like pushes the boundaries of what Fall Boy is and what the genre they're they're in is, you know, um, but this was the first Fall Out Boy album that to me didn't really live up to that potential as a whole and ultimately just felt kind of soft. I'm not going to say it fell flat because there are good 
This album is made up of really good songs, but it felt kind of soft, you know? It was also the first time on a Fall Out Boy record where a handful of songs felt like they were literally written, like, just for radio. I don't know how many people feel me on this, but songs like Alone Together, Just One Yesterday, or Young Volcanoes all feel like songs written very specifically to sound very in line with what contemporary pop radio music sounded like in 2013. Um, and let me tell you, Fall Out Boy had definitely been on the radio before, but they had never written for radio, you know what I mean? Pre-hiatus Fall Out Boy, the radio came to them. Uh, on Save Rock and Roll, it really felt like they were coming to radio, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, and despite the fact that I, like I said, I do actually like this record quite a bit, you know, it's the aspects that feel like they were playing it safe, writing some radio-ready, radio-friendly songs, and this record ultimately just lacking the urgency, intensity, and heart-on-your-sleeve passion that I had come to know and love from Fall Out Boy on literally all of their records before it makes Save Rock and Roll lower than most of their other records for me on this list. Now, the next album that uh, I'm going to be talking about might be my first, like, really big hot take on this list, but honestly, I've decided that I'm going to be unapologetic about it. I'm going to say it with my chest. Here it is. Sure the last of a dying tree, yep, you heard that right. 2018's Mania is my favorite post-hiatus Fall Out Boy album. Alright, now, assuming you haven't clicked off of this video and you're still watching, thank you, I urge you to take some deep breaths, calm down, and let me just explain myself. Uh, and for anyone who is confused, this is... This is a hot take, I feel like, because Mania is probably the most experimental post-hiatus Fall Out Boy album. They really went off in a lot of new different musical directions, uh, and boy, did this record get a ridiculous amount of hate from a lot of the fans when it came out. People were, like, not feeling this album, <laughs> at least from my perspective. Um, there's still a good majority of Fall Out Boy fans who just fucking hate this album. I've heard people say uh, that, you know, it's their most commercial-sounding album, that it's their most jock rock, axe body spray commercial sounding album, whatever, or that it simply just doesn't have the creative integrity of Fall Out Boy's previous albums. And I'm going to be straight up, I completely disagree with all of those ideas. I think this record, for what it is to me, feels like kind of the polar opposite of a lot of those things that people say about it. Um, and I don't mean to sound like condescending or anything like that, but I feel like a lot of people really just like maybe haven't given this album the time of day. I don't know. I feel like this is an album that people just wanted to hate. Like people like to hate this album. I don't know. It's definitely a polarizing release, and while I do understand that a lot of people do not like this album, I fucking love it, personally. I've loved it since it came out. I love it even more now. It's only grown on me and become more fucking amazing to me over time. Like, seriously, it has. And today, I'm gonna tell you why. I'm just, fuck the haters. I'm just telling y'all why I like this shit. <laughs> so for starters, I think a big compelling thing about this record as a whole to me is that I think they really honed in on the experimental, futuristic, arena, pop rock sound that they had been aiming for on the last couple records and really finally, like, knocked it out of the park here on Mania. Remember how I was saying that Save Rock and Roll felt like they were playing it safe and American Beauty, American Psycho felt too much like directionless, uninspired experimentation for the sake of experimentation. Mania approaches the Fall Out Boy 2.0 sound yet again, but this time around corrects all of the problems with the last two records, and Mania really has what those two previous records were lacking for me. Mania has Fall Out Boy experimenting with all types of new sounds and styles, but this time it's experimentation with a purpose. It's experimentation which has something to say, and as a band they feel more in control control, more authoritative, and generally way more inspired with their creativity um, on this record. Like I said, experimentation with a purpose goes a long way. It also, for the first time in a while, really embodies the intensity and the urgency and the firing off on all cylinders nature of Fall Out Boy's older music. But yes, it is updated and retooled and presented in new ways. You know, they're not like a post-hardcore leading pop punk band anymore at all. Fall Out Boy were really ready to try and break some new ground on this album, and to me, they fucking killed it. One thing I definitely want to note is that the lyrics on this album are way Pete Wensier than they've ever been since before the hiatus. I don't know if anyone else, like, 
uh, picked up on that, but the super melodramatic, like, patented emo Pete Wentz lyrics are back. Sure, much like the music, they're evolved, matured, presented in new ways, not as, you know, crazy, emotional, over-the-top like they used to be, but it's still some Pete Wentz-ass lyric writing for sure. Just a couple examples. I mean, the first lyric on the entire record, it starts off with, quote, I think I've got too many memories getting in the way of me. I'm about to go Tanya Harding on the whole world's knee. I mean, come on, that's such a fucking badass fucking lyric in itself and such a powerful awesome way to start off a record i think you know i love that shit i don't know it's so cool it's so author it's so in your face on the song hold me tighter don't it features the lyric but when your stitch comes loose i want to sleep on every piece of fuzz and stuffing that comes out of you something about that line feels very very fully adieu to me you know what i'm saying like that would be on the song w-a-m-s or some shit i don't know there's a lot more examples but overall this album lyrically really just feels way more fallout boy to me than the last couple albums which is one huge reason why i love these songs and this album <laughs> stay frosty royal milk tea is a fucking awesome album opener totally juiced totally sets the tone for the rest of the album and is probably the best and most powerful and like compelling attention grabbing opening track on a record they've had since Folia do, in my opinion. Hold Me Tight or Don't is like Fall Out Boy's version of like, I don't know, a Shakira or like a reggaeton sounding song. And although that does sound like it could be a total train wreck disaster on paper, Fall Out Boy totally somehow once again knocked it out of the park on this song. And this is one of my favorite songs on the whole album, one of the catchiest songs on the album. Uh, it's totally not contrived and is one of the many examples of how versatile Fall Out Boy can can be um, while still being really good at it and still being Fall Out Boy, which is one thing that I think Mania showcases really well, more so than maybe any other album they have. For all the old school fans, the track Wilson, parentheses, Expensive Mistakes, feels like an updated version of the masterful pop rock stylings they were laying down in the Infinity on High era to me. Uh, I get big Infinity on High vibes from this song. Church is my favorite song on this fucking record. Holy shit, this song is like breathtakingly amazing to me. It's my favorite post hiatus Fall Out Boy song. I can't get enough of Church, I'm serious. I like don't even have anything else to say about it besides like, I think this song's just like fucking awesome. Heaven's Gate, which feels kind of like a sister song to Church to me, is Fall Out Boy's attempt at like a doo-wop song, which once again, they really did an amazing job at. The song is really, really good. Sunshine Riptide is a weirdly super well-executed, like islandy, stoner, reggae-ish, Summer Jam featuring the artist Burna Boy, another experiment which sounds like a total disaster on paper, but they nailed it again. Like, this song is not only enjoyable to listen to, but it's a really well executed version of what I can tell that they were going for. Uh, more experimentation with a purpose and done right, and another example of how versatile of a band Fall Out Boy really are and can be. My closing thoughts are despite a lot of the hate that it got, I truly love this record and it's my favorite thing that they've done in a while. Now, of course, it still goes without saying that at the end of the day, Mania still suffers from what the other post-hiatus Fall Out Boy albums suffer from, which is the fact that, and I'm sorry to sound like a boomer here, the fact that it doesn't sound like four guys in a room together sweating and playing loud rock music together. I miss when Fall Out Boy sounded like a band. I really do. All of their post-hiatus albums are like that. They all have this really big shoot for the stars on every song, like gaudy, kind of big, overproduced arena pop production. Well, I don't know if overproduced is the word, but you know what I'm saying. To the point where you don't even know who the fuck is playing what. Like, the bass on Mania is really good. Listen to the verse on Church, for example. Pete Wentz has always been, like, a notoriously bad bass player. Is that really Pete playing that? Can Pete really... I don't know. You know what I mean? Anybody could fucking be playing that. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like Pete Wentz bass to me. And that, overall, is what all of their newer records have lacked, in a way, to me, is that unique touch of human personality which you can only get from the four members of Fall Out Boy plugged in and playing their instruments in a room together and that organic rock band aspect is something that 
I, you know, like I said, I hate to sound like a boomer, but it's just, I'm an old school fan, man. It's something I hope they return to again on a record in the future, because it would, like, mean so much to people to hear Fall Out Boy. They can experiment and do all the shit they want. I really do appreciate the experimentation. Sometimes it hits, sometimes it misses for me. Um, I greatly appreciate that aspect of Fall Out Boy. Um, but I, you know, I really miss that old feeling that they used to have and the old energy. Anyway, moving Right along, we are now entering the classic pre-hiatus period of Fall Out Boy. Thank God, am I right? I don't have to use the term Axe Body Spray commercial anymore. And what a better way to usher in this next section of the video than with yet another hot take. But there's a light on, it's Chicago, and I know if there was anybody else in this band, it would not be the same thing. If it happened in, in, under any other circumstances, it would be completely different. And like, we've had other people in the band before, and it was just like, not the same thing. It's we were just, just some local band with, yeah, you know, like, with other people. Yeah, there's just some it's weird thing, like when we all come together that like, doesn't exist otherwise. Like for Patrick, for example, I've never had a creative relationship in the same way that I have with him. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, I don't really know how to explain yeah, no, Like we hate each other half the time, <laughs> Like seriously, we're like disagree on every single point. Like anything you bring up, me and him disagree on. But then, like for some reason, like as far as like creatively, like I've never vibed with somebody as well. Well, the thing is that like the both of us like are really, really. Like, I'm gonna use focus again. I'm gonna say that thing so many times in this. Focus. 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 But um, focus. but uh, the two of us are really, really focused on what on on our own ideas and um, those two. Thi Almost always, those two things are the exact opposite idea. So um, when the two of them meet up, it's like I don't know. Somehow it, it ends up working, and it, it makes it's one of those things where I, ha I I have to rather begrudgingly admit that that a lot of times um, the stuff that he kind of kept me on a leash about made made the songs better. The songs are what I, the music is what I do, and he he does all the words and stuff. But we kind of we kind of give each other input on e on yeah. on each other's on each other's field and kind of the top. Whoa, man, it's like, whoa, man, I've seen bad stuff, but this is, I mean, you do a lot of bad stuff, but this is, is the worst. <laughs> uh, you actually wrote the worst thing ever. <laughs> Congratulations, I'm, I'm looking for the award, they must be shipping it still. <laughs> Remember the Razzies? <laughs> oh, yes, their debut, 2003's Take This to Your Grave, released on Fueled by Ramen. <laughs> Classic, the, the record that really put the band on the map in the underground emo world, as it were, at the time, and also the last time in the band's career where they were that cool new underground band that your little brother didn't know about. <laughs> because on their next record, From Under the Cork Tree, they broke into the mainstream and the rest was history. Uh, and for that reason alone, I feel like by putting this record so low on this list, the lowest ranking of all of their pre-hiatus classic albums, I've effectively lost any modicum of punk cred that I may or may not have had in the first place. It's gone. Take This to Your Grave is like the album in Fall Out Boy's career. Like, I feel like if you're like looking for like punk cred or whatever, this is the, the one where it's it's cool to say that it's your favorite one or like close to your favorite. Uh, it usually seems to be in the number one or number two spots as far as other people's Fall Out Boy album rankings, which is why I'm expecting maybe some hate for my lower placement on this album but whatever. And uh, don't get me wrong, Take This to Your Grave is an amazing, amazing record, totally groundbreaking and game-changing at the time. A really personally meaningful album to me. I fucking grew up on this album. I've always loved it. I've cried about you know, many girls to this album uh, in my bedroom when I was like 13. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and part of me almost loves the over-the-top, dark, drama queen emo lyrics and the sugary pop-punk choruses mixed with the influence of the band's hardcore roots, which gives it an intense edge that only hardcore kids could really inject into pop-punk in the right way. Uh, I almost love those aspects now more than I even loved it at the time. <laughs> 
Um, this record is a total classic. It's on a lot of like lists, like the 40 best pop punk records of all time. This album is usually on there, and rightfully so. Uh, this album influenced a lot of bands, a lot of bands over the course of the next eight or nine years after this record is released, you know, at least in the pop punk emo world, most of those bands were just releasing their own like rehashed versions of the sound that Fall Out Boy had nailed on this record in 2003. Uh, there's no denying or debating that. However, here is why I like the three other pre-hiatus Fall Out Boy albums better than this one. So I'm going to compare Fall Out Boy's discography to Nirvana's for a second, if you will just bear with me here. Uh, <laughs> let's say that Take This to Your Grave is Fall Out Boy's Bleach, right? And From Under the Core Tree, let's say, hypothetically, is their Nevermind. You feel me? Maybe you already see where I'm going with this. Uh, what is Bleach in the context of Nirvana's career? Well, it's their first album. Uh, it's a fantastic album, an amazing record, solidified their growing popularity in the underground before exploding into the mainstream on their next record, but they were still an indie band through and through on this one. It's really cool to say that this one is your favorite. It's like the cool hipster response to say that Bleach is your favorite Nirvana album, you know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, uh, uh, no matter how awesome and organic and punk and cool that Bleach is, it, it was still a relatively underdeveloped version of Nirvana and Nirvana's sound who were still just figuring out what their sound was on that album, borrowing from other contemporary acts at the time to make up a record that was at least good enough to get their band off the ground and get things rolling in the underground. It wasn't until Nevermind where they fully realized their sound were no longer just doing their own interpretation of other bands in the scene and it was fully cooked and fully developed Nirvana once Nevermind rolled around. Uh, now, <clears throat> assuming Take This to Your Grave is Bleach and From Under the Cork Tree is Nevermind in this analogy, that my friends, is the reason why Take This to Your Grave is under the rest of the pre-hiatus classic Fall Out Boy albums on this list. Amazing record, but to me, it just wasn't fully Fall Out Boy yet. Patrick hadn't discovered or honed in on his, like, amazing soul voice yet. Uh, they weren't really experimenting in cool ways yet. It's just a good pop-punk record, you know? I'm not gonna sit here and try to say that this album is a straight rip-off of Saves the Days through being cool and Taking Back Sunday's Tell All Your Friends because because it's not, but I would definitely say Take This to Your Grave is a band doing their very best personal rendition of Saves the Days Through Being Cool and Taking Back Sunday's Tell All Your Friends. Fall Out Boy, in terms of their sound, uh, hadn't really carved out their own unique place in the game yet. Well, like Lifetime is probably, I think of all the bands that are really big in punk rock and pop punk right now, is the single most ripped off band. It's Everyone will cite them as an influence, yet none of the kids really, I don't think, like I think it's like too long ago, like it's not in Hot Topic or it's not in a place that's accessible to a lot of kids, you know, and it's not flashy and it's not these guys going out and touring with like the bands that are cool right now, but like if you look at like, you know, I mean I could name them, but like, you know, like Brand New, Taking Back Sunday, Saves the Day, I think all those bands, us, I think all those bands would cite Lifetime as a huge influence, they just started doing something that was so much different and had so much sincerity and so much heart and then they were just kind of the band that did it first and then like everybody kind of came along and capitalized on it. I, I mean I, I can, speaking for us, I know we wouldn't, we wouldn't exist really without right. Lifetime, I don't think. I mean we, we might have come together and made a band but it wouldn't have been this band. That being said though, amazing record, one of my favorite records of all time, can't stress enough how extremely groundbreaking and influential this record was uh, in the context of the scene that Fall Out Boy existed in at the time. They single-handedly turned a really small Chicago local VFW hall, like high school whatever pop punk scene in the early 2000s into a literal celebrity level mainstream explosion and all of that started with the waves that Take This To Your Grave was making in the underground at the time. Take This To Your Grave practically forced every band in the emo slash pop punk world to step up their game at the time, and Pete Wentz really started blazing trails during the touring cycle of this album as people started realizing what a smart businessman he was with the tactics he was utilizing to get Fall Out Boy off the ground at the time, and people were also starting to realize what a visionary he was. Also, going back to how rough around the edges and unremarkable evening out with your girlfriend,
girlfriend was, uh, Take This to Your Grave was made not that long after Evening Out, and it's mind-blowing how much this band improved in just a short amount of time. Uh, the songwriting and musicianship on Take This to Your Grave is miles ahead, uh, light years ahead of where they were on Evening Out with Your Girlfriend, which I think really took people by total surprise in Fall Out Boy's local scene at the time, that small Chicago VFW hall scene, and it eventually started taking the whole country by surprise and Take This to Your Grave set Fall Out Boy up to go on to achieve the great major label mainstream success which they enjoyed on their next record where they ultimately took the whole world by storm. And Take This to Your Grave was like the seed that planted all that. It's like I think that we've tried to be pretty honest along the path of what we were doing and what our intentions were and with like everybody and I think that that kind of honesty in like a band or like somebody who's like on stage in front of people can breed some sort of fanaticism. And like that obviously is like a bad thing when people are calling my house at 4 a.m. and like my mom's just yelling at me. But like it's really cool on the other hand because to these kids, we're still their band. We're still like we're always going to be that band and they're up there and it doesn't matter. You know, like there's other bands that are level and they're called sellouts and people don't show up or people go there and don't know and because they're just played on the radio. And these kids like we've won over one by one or like we know a lot, like so many of those people in there are just friends that like we know, like I'm, I'm really bad with names, but I remember a lot of faces. So, I mean, I just think that it's one of those things where it's like we're still their band so they're singing with us. It's not something where they're going there and it's like that's something like we're overnight we decided like, all right, now you guys should sing all our words you know, or whatever. It's like been like that. When there was two kids at the show, that's still how it was. It just happens that there's a lot. We're, we're not like removed from these people. It's not. It's not someone that just hurt us or something. We like, you know, we, we've gone out to dinner with a lot of these people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like these, like so. So there'll be like a thousand kids, but we know all of them. You know, yeah. I, I can, I can point and, you know. played New York at Irving Plaza and, and Jay-Z introduced our band as his favorite new rock band and it's like, that's f***ing Jay-Z, dude, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's just bizarre. You know what I'm saying? You feel like you're watching someone else's life. And that perception is only brought into clarity at the most awkward of times, you know, like you'll be doing a signing and all of a sudden like someone's shaking and crying in front of you and you just see yourself the way you did when you were 14. We've made no secret of the fact that we're just kids ourselves, you know what I mean? And that there's, there's really very little difference between us on stage and the people that are in the crowd. Some of the bands that came before us, I think we're kind of scared or like, we don't want our video to be on TRL. We always just wanted to be at the forefront of everything because at the end of the day, it's like I'd rather have My Chemical Romance, Take a Mech Sunday, Panic at the Disco video than watching you know, a lot of the polished turds that are out there. Ah, uh, yes, 2007's Infinity on High. A wildly successful album for Fall Out Boy. You know, the boys were really in their prime on this one. It was their follow-up to their 2005 mainstream breakthrough success from Under the Cork Tree, and to follow up their first big mainstream success can be a pretty stressful place for a band to be. I mean, sure, it's incredible. All of your childhood dreams are coming true, and your life is now this weird Peter Pan dream world where you basically get paid to be a big adult child all day because the stars aligned and you made a smash record, you know? Um, <laughs> but the real pressure, the real stress to me would be having to make the follow-up to that record and hopefully keep the momentum going, if not getting even bigger. This is where a lot of bands tend to flop as they can often crack under the pressure of major labels whining and dining them and telling them how they're going to get as big as the Foo Fighters or, you know, the aspect of the fan fanbase who was once totally loving and supportive of the band's every move are now almost all calling them sellouts because they just so happen to achieve some success. It's a tale as old as time. There's even a term for it, the dreaded sophomore slump. And with the odds stacked against them, Fall Out Boy miraculously, like a phoenix I guess that doesn't work because they weren't really in the ashes before, but like a phoenix continuing 
flight, <laughs> Fall Out Boy miraculously released a record that not only matched the success of the one before it, uh, but totally blew it out of the water. I mean, Infinity on High was uh, Fall Out Boy's, from what I understand, highest first week sales ever, selling 260,000 copies in its first week, which is insane. Uh, it was number one on the charts and has since gone double platinum. Uh, it featured some huge top 40 like pop radio hits like This Ain't a Scene, It's an Arms Race, and Thanks for the Memories. Uh, it was supported by other successful singles like The Takeover, The Breaks Over, or I'm Like a Lawyer, as well as the crowd-pleasing fan favorite The Carpal Tunnel of Love, which I believe was the first song released from this record as a single, which is interesting. Fall Out Boy were all over fucking MTV, they were winning awards, uh, red carpets, this shit was huge. They were like Blink-182 big now. Which is great! This album killed it in the mainstream. Fall Out Boy officially beat uh, the dreaded sophomore slump or one-hit wonder status, and I know that this record is technically like their third album, so technically From Under the Cork Tree was the sophomore, but as far as Fall Out Boy existing in the mainstream world, this was their like sophomore release under the radar of the mainstream you know you know what i'm saying the band was officially creating their own culture and society of misfits and outcasts and emo kids emo kids all over the world who were genuinely connecting to their music and their band much like mcr they were starting to become somewhat of a movement as far as og pre-hiatus fall out boy is concerned if you ask me infinity on high uh the songs on this record as well as this era of the band surrounding it was like the peak of that movement Delicious. <laughs> you see AC Slater? You talk I to him did. I, his name is AC Slater. I love AC Slater. Yo. I didn't get to talk to him. Yet. You already know. Right, it, your, your style is fresh, though. Thanks, bro. I appreciate it. Chris Brown just said my style is fresh on the record, dude. On the record. And it's not just because Infinity on High was simply commercially successful. An album can be. Com you know, commercially successful and still be dog shit. We all know this. Uh, Fall Out Boy were a very, very special band at the time, and they genuinely made a very special record with Infinity on High, if you ask me. For one thing, they grew so much musically between From Under the Cork Tree and Infinity. Uh, the growth may not be as noticeable or overt as it is on later Fall Out Boy records, because Infinity really did still sound a lot and feel like classic Fall Out Boy. It still had like a warp Tour element to it. Um, but if you look closely, the band really did expand their sound and took it to the next level. This album is a lot bigger than anything that they had done before, uh, like literally in the sense that they had just started playing arenas before they started writing Infinity. So I imagine that they had the experience and the feeling of playing these gigantic rooms in mind while writing this record. So the whole record is just so much more expansive and grandiose and beefed up than anything that they had done before. They were arena ready, but not in a lame, kitschy, watered down sellout kind of way. And like a genuinely like we're here and we're fucking in charge and this shit's awesome kind of way, you know? The heart and soul of Fall Out Boy was still very much intact and on the forefront. While the endlessly catchy, upbeat pop punk banger Don't You Know Who I Think I Am, or the driving melodramatic emo dance vibes of fame, infamy, or the warp tour ready hum hallelujah harken back to Fall Out Boy's classic signature sound, uh, which they became known for on previous records, other tracks show the band taking plenty of leaps and bounds into new uncharted territory. Of course, of course, there's Golden, the beautifully moody piano ballad with some soul-crushing vocals from Patrick over just a piano, a real stripped-down emotional track. Take the mid-tempo I'm Like a Lawyer, for example. This is the first time Fall Out Boy had ever done like a mid-tempo, tender love song like this one, like something you can cuddle your 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 significant other to or whatever, you know, um, and have it be like real romantic. Uh, <laughs> and not only that, this song is also pretty funky, especially on the verses. Uh, this was a new element of Fall Out Boy that started showing up on this record. They had a funky, like, R&B leaning side to them now, and I'm Like a Lawyer definitely showcases that. This is also an absolutely just amazing song, by the way. Totally beautiful chorus, easily one of my favorite songs on this whole album, probably one of my favorite Fall Out Boy songs, like, 
ever one of them for me, I think. Uh, the Takeover the Breaks Over, uh, which was another single, also mixes classic Fall Out Boy with this new funky R&B kind of flair, uh, while the Afterlife of the Party brings to the table another more relaxed mid-tempo track with genuinely tear-jerking emotional lyrics and vocals. Like, the song's kind of intense. That's one thing that I wanted to bring up about this album. For some reason, these songs, specifically in Patrick's voice, I think, always, like, make me choked up or like want to want to cry <laughs> this doesn't happen with other fall out boy albums or like other albums that much to me uh i don't cry like all that easily i don't think but infinity on high for some reason something about the vibe of this record always just no matter where i am or what kind of day i'm having it always gets me choked up for some reason like i always these songs always just make me want to cry i don't know it's just such a vibe you know uh the carpal tunnel of love showcases the band revisiting some of their hardcore roots while patrick also delivers some of his best vocal performances on the whole record on this song bang the doldrums is like a pop punk sea shanty which on paper sounds like a terrible disaster of an idea but like much like stuff on mania like i was talking about fall out boy actually made it work insanely well and they totally pulled it off uh and this song is amazing one of the best choruses on this album definitely a song that only fallout boy could have pulled off i've also heard that that song bang the doldrums was like rejected from the maybe the shrek 2 or shrek 3 soundtrack which is really funny but yeah you get the idea fallout boy was bigger and more beefed up than ever before they were expanding and diversifying their sound they wrote a batch of genuinely incredible songs which yet again pushed the boundaries of the entire genre that they existed in um and also really really even further carved out their own unique lane in the game, so to speak, both in the sort of warp Tour underground world and the mainstream world on this one. It's pretty cool. Hard to do that. And they made a record that always makes me want to cry. <laughs> but they fucking killed it. There's also a literal spoken word intro from Jay-Z on the first track, which goes directly into a literal pop-punk breakdown. Like, that's the, it, that's the first 20 seconds of a record that sold 260,000 copies copies in its first week in 2007. That is fucking amazing. Also, I feel like it's very important to note that this is the album where Patrick really started coming out of his shell as a talented, experienced vocalist, you know? It sounds like the guy may have gotten a singing lesson or two between, uh, from Under the Cork Tree in this album. You know, this is where Patrick's famous soul voice really starts rearing its head in the door, uh, and it's sick. All of a sudden, he's doing, like, boys to men type shit over Fall Out Boy tracks. He's got straight-up Beyonce moments all over this album, and he absolutely murders it. Like, Another example of Fall Out Boy doing something that was very out out on a limb, but didn't feel contrived because it really felt like that's just the way this dude sings and it works for this band, you know? Everyone has always said it, but Patrick Stump really is the real deal talent-wise, so I gotta give it up for Infinity on High. Uh, the reason why this album is number three on this list is because, well, let me put it this way. Right now, we're kind of getting into the part of this list where, like, starting at this album and from this album beyond, these albums are all pretty much solid tens for me. I don't really have much negative stuff to say about them. The only reason why this one is number three uh, is because I can think of reasons why the other two above it are maybe more standout or perhaps more noteworthy. And with that, we will segue into uh, my second favorite Fall Out Boy album of all time. Can you guess what it is? I mean, there's only two left. It's either one or the other. You can probably guess, right? I don't think this one's a hot take. All right, I'm just gonna tell you. Here it is. record called Bully I Do. It's a, an old psychiatric term um, from, uh, from France, obviously, uh, that translates to the shared madness of two, and that's kind of really what it means is just when two people have this kind of, they kind of share an obsession and insanity, and it kind of it gets exponentially greater, and it's untreatable ultimately. Um, and we use it kind of metaphorically. It's a, the record's a little bit of a satire, <coughs> satire about um, the selfishness, basically. Um, so that's what the record kind of is about. But I also, at the same time, I don't want to, um, I feel bad when I say that because I feel like it's like such a serious answer, such a, you know, such a, um, 
model and answer. Oh yes, baby, 2008's Foley Adu. Sometimes thought of as the Black Sheep Fall Out Boy record, the slight commercial failure, later turned cult classic Fall Out Boy record, the most experimental pre-hiatus Fall Out Boy record by a long shot, uh, and also the last album they released in their original run uh, before they announced their hiatus at the end of 2009, just about a year or so after Foley Adu had been released. Least. It's often thought of as Fall Out Boy's Pinkerton or Patrick Stump's Pet Sounds, if you will. Not comparing it musically to either of those records, definitely not, just in terms of what it represents in the Fall Out Boy discography and the general narrative of the record. Like I said, this album is the first time Fall Out Boy made a real noticeable change in their sound, and while many elements of it are still very true to classic Fall Out Boy, it doesn't sound like, you know, pop Fall Out Boy 2.0 like their recent records. Uh, in fact, this album, I think, is quite the opposite. There's a lot less of the frantic pop punk sound that we've come to know from Fall Out Boy on this album, and they expanded their sound and pushed the boundaries in so many ways, causing this album to be really special and have its own unique sound of its own. It was really something different and next level in the midst of how oversaturated and monotonous the emo wave that Fall Out Boy were a part of was starting to become by 2008. Uh, on Foley, Fall Out Boy yet again managed to push the boundaries and do something different than everybody and continue to move forward in carving out their own unique lane uh, and were still better than most of the other bands doing emo and pop punk at the time, if you ask me, of course. I do gotta say, along with the album's rich experimentation and boundary-pushing nature, one of the big standouts on this album is Patrick and what Patrick brought to the table on Fully Adu. Going back to how I was saying that this album is kind of like Patrick Stump's Pet Sounds, what I mean by that is this is the record where Patrick Stump, uh, to put it bluntly, absolutely freaked it. Patrick turned into a total musical madman on this album. His vocals are absolutely insane. If you want a Fall Out Boy album with the highest amount, like cranked up to 11, the most concentrated Patrick Stump soul voice, the best example of over-the-top Patrick Stump soul voice, Foley is the record to listen to. Patrick was singing his ass off on this record, but it was still very, very tasteful and ultimately very, very just good the way he was approaching it so that it wasn't this like it, was, it still managed to be in the pocket somehow. Patrick has definitely never been as unhinged and unleashed with his vocals since this album, which goes back to the sort of Pinkerton narrative of the album. Uh, I'd say one of the best examples of Patrick's insane vocal chops is definitely the track Head First Slide into Cooperstown on a Bad Bet. Uh, he's really going crazy over this entire fucking song. <laughs> at the end of the day, if you ask me, this is more so than a great Fall Out Boy album. This is Patrick Stump's real, like, work of art at the end of the day. Uh, more so than his solo record, Soul Punk, more so than even the older, more, maybe more classic Fall Out Boy records. Uh, in terms of Patrick's creativity and musical journey, Foley Adu is just Patrick's masterpiece. It's like his apex. <laughs> that being said, I would say that I think musically speaking, this is easily Fall Out Boy's best album, period. I also think that it's their best album lyrically, you know? Although Pete Wentz was still often uh, churning out middle school 13-year-old girl emo diary entry humorous clunkers like I'm not a crybaby, I'm the crybaby, or oh baby, when they made me, they broke the mold. Despite, you know, that stuff here and there, I think that this album has definitely the most honest, introspective, genuine, and just ultimately the best collection of Pete Wentz lyrics that I can think of, all albums included. I believe that Pete was having his first son, Bronx, at the time and was also married to Ashley Simpson. He was also still going through the whirlwind of Fall Out Boy's initial fame and his celebrity status, and I think this album is the most real and most honest he ever got about his deep, true, personal feelings lyrically on a record, especially during that time. We were tried to, we tried to go to Antarctica earlier this year, 
And uh, we ended up in the southernmost populated city in South America, in Chile. It was us and some sheep. And my wife, fiance of the time, told me that she was pregnant. And then she had to go over and tell her dad. And I was so happy that I was in the southernmost point of Chile at the time. <laughs> Nearly unbelievable. It's called She's My Winona. This album is kind of like, I would almost describe it as Infinity on High on Mushrooms. Also, this is without a doubt my second favorite Andy Hurley drum album right behind Take This to Your Grave. Absolutely love Andy's work on this thing. He was ripping it up. This album features a ton of features, uh, no pun intended, from a bunch of other artists. Uh, there's a Brendan Urie feature on $20 Nosebleed, as well as a really cool, iconic Lil Wayne feature on the totally underrated track Tiffany Blues. Lil Wayne sang on this song, uh, he did not rap. It's a singing part and hearing Lil Wayne sing was like a pretty big deal at the time um, It was like before he did his like rock album or whatever Also personally, I just want to say that I think Tiffany Blues should have been a single or maybe had a music video or something I mean, I think this track is totally underrated the coolest guest vocal moment is definitely on the tear-jerking ballad What a catch Donnie which features this big part at the end this big like reprise section where a bunch of follow-up boys friends sing callbacks to older Fall Out Boy songs and kind of like a medley over this big grandiose part. All the vocals are doing some ear candy shit where they're going back and forth from like one headphone to the other. Those who did guest vocals on this song are, get ready for this, Brendan Urie from Panic at the Disco, Alex Dillian from The Cab, William Beckett from The Academy Is, Travi McCoy from Gym Class Heroes, Gabe Supporta from Cobra Starship, and get this, Patrick Stump's literal, like, self-proclaimed favorite musician of all time, Elvis Costello. <sniffs> crazy. All singing lyrics from older Fall Out Boy songs during this one crazy big part. Truly fucking legendary and insane. Uh, this album didn't really have any big radio singles, uh, d unlike, you know, their last two albums. It was supported by the lead single, I Don't Care, which did fairly well on MTV and stuff, but, you know, it wasn't a dance dance or a thanks for the memories. It certainly wasn't a sugar we're going down. The song America's Sweethearts was also a single, but again, it failed to live up to the heights, uh, you know, that their singles had hit prior. It also had a really, really strange music video that's I, that I don't love. This is not my favorite... <laughs> Fallout Boy music video. But it doesn't really matter because like I said, I think this is a truly special record which continues to mean a lot to a lot of people on a really personal level. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I truly think this is Fall Out Boy's best record, at least musically and lyrically speaking. I'm not even going to really try to get into more of like describing the music on this album because I really do feel like it's the kind of record where the music kind of just speaks for itself. The only reason that this record is number two on this list, you know, because I have often called this album my favorite Fall Out Boy album in the past, and I do think it's their best album, like, musically, and the only reason, uh, why it's not in the number one spot is simply because I think the record that I did put in the number one spot on this list is simply a, just a much bigger landmark in the band's career and is a lot more iconic in many ways, but obviously we'll get into all that in a second um, because all this being said Foley Adu is also kind of a sad album to me like obviously it was right before Fall Out Boy went on hiatus uh, but it also came right around the time where the beloved emo pop punk scene which Fall Out Boy came from and were main power players in well this scene was a couple years away from pretty much totally dying although Foley is a, a genuinely amazing album musically to me it reminds me of a time when the scene that I grew up in and found so much solace in as a misfit youth was starting to become almost like hair metal. It was starting to be a bit oversaturated, a bit bloated, full of bands trying to sell out arenas and become the next Fall Out Boy by any means necessary. It was becoming a little too far removed from the like DIY genuinity which the scene embodied just a few years earlier. And for that reason, and for a plethora of other reasons, Foley felt like kind of a sad album and kind of came out at a weird time for Fall Out Boy and a weird time for the scene as a whole. Regardless, like I said though, I think if we're sheerly just talking about the music and the songwriting and the musicianship and the performances and not like what this record meant in the grand scheme of their whole career, I think Foley might 
to this day be the best thing Fall Out Boy have ever done? I think that like people, <sighs> for some reason, like people have given it like this thing that like we are so sad about this album or something like, but like we're not. And people think that like it's this album like we dislike and it's not. I think that it was an album that so like we'd put out two albums in a row that like just everything was went perfect you know like it was like one of those things where it was like oh like every album we put out it's going to be like that and that's just not the way a career is you know like i've you know remember seeing that uh bono talk about how like careers are these things that go up and down and they move and you just have to kind of go with them and appreciate that the way that is um and i think we put out fully i do you know, at a time when music literally, pop music literally turned to four on the floor. So it was like Gaga, every song was dance music, four on the floor beat. And it was just a weird time to put out a record like Foley I Do, which also was a bit of a left turn for a record in general. Um, but yeah, like I feel the same about it now that I did then. The one thing I will say is like, there's songs on Foley I Do that feel like they were like, 80% finished as far as like they were like more of sketches and I wish we had like been able to figure out how to like and this is just a personal feeling wish we'd been able to figure out how to complete them but clearly we put them on an album and they're complete to other people now so like that is what it, what it is but like I think it was a cool record and it was fun to make and it's okay to have ones that are like I don't know I think it's fine to have your 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 career and your art kind of go like that because that's just what life is like for, for literally everybody on the planet, you know? I think that we should have probably taken space and like pushed the record back. That record was actually a, the only record we've ever put out that was pushed back by our record label, you know what I mean? And I think that like with Mania, we pushed it back and we like, like really like dug in and figured out and I kind of wish we had been able to do that with Foley I Do, but at the same time, there's like so many records by bands, you know, you know, like that that I like, you know, like whether it's like uh, Pinkerton or, you know, like whatever it is. And like to to you, it's your favorite album and the band feels like it's like once you put a record out, it's like that's changes how things are. And I think that like sometimes people don't remember that like 10 years ago, this music was just at a different place kind of, you know, and so like you have to give, you have to like contextualize it because years just take the context or change the context, you know? So like people are like, that was my favorite record. It should have been so big and this and that. And it's like, it's all, I mean, it's all good. I, I appreciate that it's people's favorite record, but it's all good that it was like, was what it was because it makes you appreciate, like the, 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 the way the, the, the ups and downs make you appreciate the, the journey as a whole, kind of, I guess. And I wish I had the track list so I could sit here and point out the ones that I think are more sketches. But it's also, it, it's also just like an overall kind of feeling I have for it. And that being said, uh, we are now going to transition into the most iconic of all Fall Out Boy albums. I don't think that's very uh, much debated, and I'm sure you all know what it is by now. So here goes. This album is saying that you can be able to compete with all these um, things coming out in the world, whether they be bands or you know great big you know marketing schemes or whatever. But you don't have to compete in it, and you can go about your own road and. Hopefully people will see the sincerity in that and kind of come along with you on that path. And I'd say that that's probably the overall theme of the record more than anything. And the winner is... Fallout Boy. Sugar, we going down. Yo. So there's a lot of people we have to thank. We have to thank Bob, Crush Management, Jay-Z, everybody at Island Def Jam. Really importantly, My Chemical Romance for shooting Helena, which is the video that we think should have won. You guys are amazing. Best fan on earth. And this is proof that if we could do this, everybody on the planet Earth can do this. This is the most important award tonight, we think, because the fans voted on it. So thank you to all the Fall Out Boy fans who have stuck with us through everything. You mean the world to us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. No surprise here, right, guys? 
2005's From Under the Cork Tree, their second real proper record, the follow-up to the underground success of 2003's Take This to Your Grave, and From Under the Cork Tree, as I've said many times already in this video, was their mainstream breakthrough success. Boosted off of the success of huge singles like Sugar We're Going Down, Dance Dance, and A Little Less 16 Candles, A Little More Touch Me, From Under the Cork Tree debuted at number two on the U.S. Billboard 200 with 168,000 copies sold in its first week. Uh, it was on the charts for... 78 fucking weeks straight and has since sold 2 million copies in the US and over 3 million worldwide which is insane uh it has reached the status of double platinum Now, when From Under the Cork Tree was released, it received pretty positive reviews with all music stating, quote, Musically, Cork Tree's first five tracks are relentless with razor-sharp melodies that seem familiar but sound totally unique at the same time. The OOs and punchy chords of Of All the Gin Joints in All the World are a thrill greater than any Jimmy Eat World album ever. Sugar We're Going Down's halftime shifts are triumphs of tumbling words, and the opening track mediates Riley on All Ages Show's fame. Further, when Fall Out Boy rip into sophomore slump or comeback of the year, summer of 2005 will not be able to ignore them. I, truer words have never been spoken, my friends. We're the therapists pumping through your speakers, delivering just what you need. They sing, it's obviously time to embrace our inner mall kid. I, you know, I will just, I don't usually quote, quote reviews very much, but that kind of summed up a lot of like, I, you know, I fucking feel that review. Either way, like I said earlier, and I want to reiterate that if you compare Fall Out Boy's discography to Nirvana's, I think Take This to Your Grave is their bleach and... From Under the Cork Tree is definitely there, never mind. Once again, not musically speaking, but or like not comparing it musically to that record or whatever, but just in terms of the narrative of their career. Y'all know what I'm saying. Despite that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that From Under the Cork Tree was or is the most fully realized version of Fall Out Boy because obviously they've grown and expanded and made so many great records since then. And I also wouldn't necessarily say it's musically their best album either. Like I was just saying, I think that that title goes to Folie Adieu. But <clears throat> the reason why I picked this one for number one is for two big reasons. And those two big reasons actually break down into like a bunch of different little reasons. So just bear with me here. Um, the first big reason is the monumental impact that this record had on the trajectory and the career of the band Fall Out Boy. It was not only a great album, but this is obviously the one that put them on the map. It changed all of their lives forever. It introduced the whole world to a very special band who ended up becoming a very special part of literally millions of people's lives. And looking back, while this may not be the most fully realized Fall Out Boy album, I think this is definitely Fall Out Boy in their purest form. It's like the most concentrated Fall Out Boy, you know what I mean? Like orange juice. It's definitely the definitive moment where Fall Out Boy really found their own sound and carved out, for the first time, carved out their own unique place in the music world. They weren't just like a saves the day, not rip off, but saves the day rehash anymore or whatever. They were, on this album, they were fucking Fall Out Boy, you know? Um, and this album to me is like the most iconic version of Fall Out Boy. When you say Fall Out Boy to your friend or like your mom or any random person the thing that usually like statistically will pop into their head first is the from under the cork tree era of this band and the from under the cork tree sound of this band as well uh, as well as you know the big songs on from under the cork tree are like the ones that people usually think of first sugar we're going down dance dance um and i think there's really something to be said for that in terms of this specific record's legacy the second big reason is the monumental impact that this record had on the music scene in which Fall Out Boy came from, as well as the music world as a whole following it. Not only uh, was this record a key integral record which helped launch the neon pop punk wave of the late 2000s with bands like All Time Low or Mayday Parade kind of riding the coattails of the mainstream successes of records like From Under the Cork Tree, which really put this sound on the map, but From Under the Cork Tree's success was also a major part in putting the now basically major label Fueled by Ramen on the fucking map. <laughs> now Fall Out Boy first signed to Fueled by Ramen when they put out Take This to Your Grave, and before I say anything else, Fall Out Boy 
Boy uh, had actually upstreamed to a major label, Island Records, for the release of Cork Tree. Uh, but Pete Wentz was still super close with Fueled by Ramen founder John Janik, and Pete actually had his own imprint label off of Fueled by Ramen called Decadence Records, which was also a very big deal and was kind of synonymous with Fueled by Ramen at the time. Uh, apparently, when Fall Out Boy was looking for a label to release Take This to Your Grave, they really wanted to sign to Drive Thru, uh, who were probably the biggest pop punk label in the early 2000s with bands like Newfound Glory, The Starting Line, Midtown, The Early November, Finch, uh, all that shit. Phoenix TX, Hello Goodbye, Homegrown. Y'all know about Homegrown. <laughs> Anyways, obviously things didn't work out with Fall Out Boy trying to sign a drive through so they were in talks with a bunch of other labels. Apparently even major labels were in talks with them prior to the release of Take This to Your Grave, which is insane. Uh, and apparently their ties with Island Records go all the way back to that label being interested in their songs on Grave. Uh, but Fall Out Boy ended up signing to Fueled by Ramen at the time, who were a very, very small indie label when Fall Out Boy came on board. I think the biggest Fueled by Ramen band at the time might have been like The Stereo or Punchline, who most of y'all probably don't even know who those bands are. You know what I mean? Um, I believe the biggest thing that Fueled by Ramen had done at the time was I think they released an EP by Jimmy Eat World in the late 90s or something, uh, but nothing else even remotely as noteworthy as that up to that point. So Fall Out Boy really kind of took a chance on this small label by signing with them uh, because they they wanted their band to rise naturally and organically on a smaller label first in the underground uh, and, you know, really uh, pay their dues and, and, and mark a place in the underground before entering the major label world. Uh, as you can imagine, Fall Out Boy quickly became the biggest band on Fueled by Ramen, and although Cork Tree was on Island, uh, once Cork Tree blew up and Fall Out Boy was on the map, Fueled by Ramen, as well as Pete Wentz's Fueled by Ramen imprint label Decadence, blew up and were put on the map as well, uh, which from there, John Jan and Pete Wentz basically took Fueled by Ramen into Cadence and turned it into what I would consider the second coming of Drive Thru, the new updated late 2000s version of what Drive Thru was in the early 2000s. Huge mainstream acts like Paramore and Panic at the Disco spawned from this, uh, as well as countless other bands like Gym Class Heroes, The Academy Is, Cobra Starship, The Hush Sound, Cute Is What We Aim For, the list goes on and on. A whole big mainstream level musical wave, a very special musical moment in time and in culture spawned off from the success of From Under the Cork Tree. That's another reason why I kind of compare what this record represented um, to Nirvana's Nevermind. And remember, it's really not a musical comparison, but just in terms of what that record represented and how that record turned into this whole big scene, you know, this whole big mainstream movement. I think... And I have always felt like, and people probably disagree with me on this, I'm not saying this is like correct, but to me, I have always felt like From Under the Cork Tree was the nevermind of the neon pop punk wave of the late 2000s. Not the early 2000s, the late 2000s. Uh, if late 2000s neon pop punk was grunge, From Under the Cork Tree was nevermind, Fueled by Ramen was sub pop, and Seattle was Chicago. You see what I'm saying? Uh, now, I could go on and on and talk about how important and meaningful From Under the Cork Tree is to me personally and is to so many other people out there, uh, but honestly, it would mostly just be in vain, and I don't want to bore you with that, so I guess I will just close this off by saying that this record is incredible. It's changed my life. I probably like wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Uh, like My life my life literally might have been completely different had I not discovered this record when I was like eight years old in fucking third grade in like 2005 or whatever, you know? Um, it still sounds just as fresh and new and exciting to me as it did back in 05 and 06. And this is just a huge comfort album for me. It's just like, you know, whenever things aren't things I'm having a shitty day or things aren't going my way in life, like this album has always got my back. You know what I mean? And, um, much like Foley I do, I kind of consider this an album that speaks for itself musically. And with that, thank you for watching. This has been Fall Out Boy's discography, worst to best. Did you like this video? I've never done a video like this before, and I wanted to try something new and something different, and I had a lot of fun with this one. Much love to Fall Out Boy and all the Fall Out Boy fans. Believers Never Die, Overcast Kids. Y'all know what the fuck I'm talking about.
Have a peaceful day, y'all. It's been the Cozy Representative. Peace out.